Okay, so let's do an example of that reduction of order stuff. How did I end up with two of these things? So weird. Since they're asexually reproducing in their bags, it's really freaky. Um, let's pick one out of here. Oh, I see. That's the one you were doing. Haha. <laughs> let's do. Doesn't really matter. Yeah, that one looks interesting. I don't want to do that one. Let's do. That one looks almost too interesting. All right, let's do. Yeah, okay. I'll do that one. Why not? Zero. And we know that uh, this is one solution. What is it now? This is almost too insane to believe. Okay. That's where you are. X sine and natural log of X. It's a really common function. You see that everywhere. So there's three functions in there? Well, there's product of two functions with one chain thing going on, right? Chain, yeah. Yeah. Math 180 haters. Nightmare. Uh, so how does this reduction of order method work? Where do we start? Try again. Sorry, John. Yes? No. See, I, I, I'm given that this is a solution. I'm not going to waste time verifying it. So why does right? the U times yes, Y1? Yes, I like it. Because this is the same thing as saying, what is this all about? What is this the same thing as saying? I mean, why do I assume this? Why is it okay to assume this? Because the second solution must be solved with this one? Why, well, no, not really. You're assuming there's one solution that's fine enough. Yes, but why am I allowed to do that? You're assuming they're linearly independent. Yes, in fact, I know they have to be linearly independent. I really want this understood. There's no reason that one function should be based on the other, except for like in a really stupid way. Like one function is f of x, and the other one's g of x over f of x. So when you multiply, you get g of I mean, I did an example like that last time. Didn't I remember anything? So if this, the fundamental idea behind here isn't that I think that these have to be related somehow, because sometimes they're really not. Very many times they are, but sometimes they're not. The fundamental idea behind this is they have to be linearly independent. And if they have to be linearly independent, this is true, period. I really want that understood. This isn't us just taking a guess. This isn't us just going, let's try this shit. No, this is just true. I like it. And why do I know there is a second solution to really make this completely true? Because second, second order. Second order. Okay. Um, now, what do I do with this? Yes. Now I'm assuming an answer of the form of this. Now I can take derivatives and throw it in and see what happens. See what conditions have to be met for that to be an answer. Uh, let's see. So y prime. Ooh, this one is. Ooh, this one is. Ux. So let's see. U prime x sine ln x. That's easy. Plus. U sine L and X, right? Yeah. Move this thing back to get the whole thing. When you have to turn your paper the other way or move the camera back to get the whole problem, that's a good indication you're in higher level shit. Plus UX cosine L and X. Over x, right? So u. So just u cosine. What? Is that cool? Because it'd be u x cosine ln x. Derivative inside is over x. The x is die. Okay, cool. I like it. Don't oh, I picked a good one. Shit. Uh, you just gotta u double prime x sine ln x. I do this for myself. Let's see. 
Let's see what I'm doing. Plus U prime. I basically repeat some of the stuff up there with just carrying the U prime. I'm still working on that one, right? Yeah. Plus U prime. And the same kind of stuff happens. Cosine. I mean, is that cool? Because that is basically the same thing, really, right? In, in a very interesting way. So that's that's that plus. I always do my U stuff first, just because, just to make it easier to organize. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. U prime sine sine ln x. I could line up my like terms, but I didn't. Plus, yeah, U cosine ln x. Good. Over x. There was no x to kill that x. Damn. So that's that's that one. Plus, U prime cosine ln x. Plus, minus. U sine ln x over x. Yeah. This is what I call like developing math stamina, right? Yeah. Just kind of starts and precalc a little bit, you know, and then it really amps up in like you know, 280, 281, and you know, linear. Hello, if you take it linear, you need some stamina to get through some of the proofs. <laughs> Um, I'll put all that into there. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, uh, x squared <laughs> would do u double prime. Well, look what happened to you. One little thing. It's all smooshy. All right, u double prime. Where'd it go? X sine x. X cubed. Sine ln x. Sine ln x. U prime x squared. U prime. Was there any like terms here? Yeah, yeah, here. U prime sine L of X. Is that cool? Yeah. And then, is there anything else? Oh, here. U prime cosine L of X. Yeah. Is that cool? You guys see that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, all right. Let's see. Why the hell did I pick this one? Shit, Jeff. Plus 2 U prime X squared sine L and X. Plus uh, 2u prime x squared cosine ln x. Uh, let's see what else is left alive. And then those two down there, so this would be plus uh, ux. Is that cool? Yeah. U ux cosine and ux sine. That's this. <laughs> I this stuff right now. You got to separate the process from the particulars, right? Is it minus? Maybe. I don't know. That's sine minus? Last one. Yeah, thanks. I didn't even look over there. I was just so into saying ux. Um, you got to separate the process that doesn't change from the particulars. And the particulars for this one is we had a product of three functions that made everything kind of huge. You just gotta kind of power through that, but the process doesn't care. The process doesn't change. Uh, where am I at? So that was the that was this guy, right? So now I'm on to this guy. So this will be minus u prime x squared. U prime x squared sine sine ln x plus u minus u x sine ln x minus u x cosine. Because of that minus there. And then finally, plus 2x sine. Now, if you're smarter than I was here, you can you can make sure you line up all your like terms, but I kind of forgot that on the way through this. Equals. Here. So let's see what happens like terms wise. I get uh, it's the only u double prime term. Wait, what happened to this guy? 
<laughs> he come from? Oh, shit, Jeff. Yeah. Excuse me. Well, that's you, I thought I see. Can you combine the, the new part inside our neck? Oh, yeah, I was in the middle of doing that. Okay. Can you figure out those electrons? Oh, God. Yeah. So the native UX sign, our neck cancels out. Yeah, so we got, uh, well, okay, let's take care of this. These guys go away. Yeah. All right, so I got less shit to look at. Anything else going? This. You always look at your U, I don't know if you guys remember, but your U stuff has to. It's part of the design of the process. Your U stuff has to. Other stuff might. Uh, let's see, any other like terms here? It looks like, yeah, it looks like 2U prime x squared, 2U prime x squared cosine. That one does. Yeah. So I lose part of this, right? So I get plus u prime x squared sine ln x. Is that cool? Because I have two of them, I lost one of them. Uh, let's see, anything else here? And then I have this guy over here, plus 2u prime x squared cosine. Here. Something still feels off about that, but oh well. Oh, you picked it, Jeff. I know. Alright. 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 So then we've got. Now what do I do? From the beginning, x could not be 0, right? Mm -hmm. So I can divide by x squared. Right? In fact, I might as well divide by x cubed sine because I've got to get u double prime by itself anyway. All right, let me stop right here, you guys. Where is this going to eventually lead to? One of two things. One of two forms. Where will it lead to? Integration factor. Linear, which is the integrating factor. Yeah. Or... Straight up integration. I mean, we saw that one. If the u's and the u primes go away, it's it's beautiful. You just straight up integrate twice. Uh, so I want to get my u double prime term alone first, so then I can figure out what a p of x is going to be. Yeah. What's up? Is, yeah, is anybody double checking this? No. I'm trying to. <laughs> it feels like something more should happen, but that's all right. The problem is like this. How it's wider paper. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you should. Seriously, trust me. I did that in many of my classes. Turn that thing over. Don't get weird sized paper. Please don't do that to me. Just turn yours this way. All right. uh, sometimes that's not even enough. Then you divide by x cubed sine. That's one thing, right? That's one thing. Pick up the loophole, right? That's one thing, right? I like it. And on the way, I can let w equal u prime. So w prime equals u double prime. So I get w prime plus w times uh, 1 over x plus, where'd it go? 2 over x. Is that right? Oh, I see. 2 over x cotangent ln x. Oh, my God. Mm. <laughs> Wait, what happened there? <laughs> all right, well, uh, so, so, all right. Is it recorded really cool that W, W, W? Yeah. So I just factored the W out of these. Do this division, you get. Oh, so that's 1 over X. 1 over X. And here you get uh, cosine over sine times 2 over X. So it's cotangent, right? Cosine over sine is cotangent. Which tells me, I, I really feel like something else probably should have canceled there, but maybe not. What? Why did you do the W? Uh, it's just standard practice because we don't have an official way to handle this, but we do have an official way to handle when they're offset by a degree, by, by an order, right? It's just to make it more officially first order linear so that I have a process to use against that. Do you really have to make this substitution? Not really. Okay. doesn't change the math. Single is the prior chapter. So what's your P of X? Linear. One over yeah. X plus two over X plus one over X. Cotangent, yeah. Uh, you have to do E to the interval of that, which... 
It's doable, but my God, it's the only more than likely. I mean, this would be a use of away from being something you could do, right? All right. So I just I, I did what's called picked poorly for an example, but oh well. I mean, I really really hope, even though this is rather disgusting, this interval is not looking like it's impossible because it's a use of away from being a. Uh, uh, through to a cotangent, I mean the integral of a cotangent, which is cosine over sine. You can figure that out if you don't know it. Uh, and this piece is easy enough, oh, right? Okay. So it's still doable. Um, I mean, right now we're linear. So really, if you can follow now, now I know there's a lot of parts to this problem, but what's the idea of the process? You know, the other answer's got to be independent of this one. That leads you down filling in all of the derivatives that are present in the problem, put those in, you know what should happen, all your u terms have to go away, your u prime terms might go away, the very first one we did that happened, and then you end up with a linear, you can do the integrating factor, I like it. So this is why you said 4.2 is going to be fun. Yes. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I really, it would really, I mean, we could keep going. I don't know if you guys can see, no, please don't. I don't want to spend all day on this particular problem. Yes? So you divide by sine ln x because x zero also? Because the only way I can see my p of x, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the only way that this could be, well, they didn't really tell us an interval, but if you think about it, if, uh, well, how might I want to say this? ln of x cannot equal 0, which is the fundamental place where sine is 0. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So sort of, yeah, we'd have to, the interval would have to come out of the form of the answer. So, yeah. But as I'm doing this, I'm assuming this can't be 0, so I'm allowed to divide by it. In fact, I have to divide by it because I have to get this by itself so I can see what p of x is. Okay, okay, okay. And then this is just linear. This is going back to chapter 2, believe it or not. Kind of an ugly piece to it, but still. I mean, how do you do integral cotangent? Cosine over sine. Yeah, you can do cosine over sine so if you want to. Sine. Yeah, u equals sine. Then you e u equals cosine. Solve That's awesome. Right? Mm -hmm. So you get integral of 1 over u to u. So you get natural log of sine of x. Don't worry about the plus c because that's a part of this work here. All right, all right, all right. So you have that. I know the example in here is a kind of an easy one, but again, what makes a problem hard is is not necessarily the process. The process is pretty simple. It's when you have more disgusting multi-part p of x's to work with. Because this is going to be linear most of the time, and sometimes it'll be, again, it'll just be a double derivative equal to something you can just integrate directly. So the only way to make this really ugly, to be honest, is to make the functions you're working with difficult to integrate, which you know is easy to do. Um, I, you need to focus on the process itself, right? This gets you going. And what's the idea, again, behind this? This has to be linearly independent from that. It's a beautiful idea. Okay. Um, let me see. I don't know. Do you want to do another one that's really easy and just to focus on the process? Yeah. Or do you guys want to do that? that? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to do, oh well, I guess it doesn't make sense. <laughs> what, I, I mean, as they do these, you can pick up on this is ways like to organize stuff. Right <laughs> Line up your like terms as you do it, right? But we learned this, this little thing about making sure you don't forget parts, because that's some of you guys just kind of go to the next one before you're done. That's normally what happens if you, your u's don't go away. You just didn't do enough derivatives over there. You forgot part of a prodigal. Uh, let's see. All right. All day on this, Jeff. All right. Let's do this. I like it, Jeff. Did we do this one? We didn't do this one already, did we? Six y double prime plus y prime minus y. That is the same. E to the 
Where'd it go? There it is. E to the x over 3. No, I don't think we did this one. We did. We did? There is over oh, okay, I got you. That's a different one. Yes, it is. Not really, but we'll... So the process is what drives everything. You start a course with yeah, this is y1. Y equals u e to the x over 3. You guys try to go a few more steps beyond that. That happens really, 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 really often. Really, 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 really often. Every time. So now I just plug this stuff in. In fact, I mean, oh, let me. I don't know how comfortable you are with what we talked about the other day. You see how e to the x over three is in everything. And e to the x over three cannot be zero. I mean, the reason I can do what I'm about to do is because this side is zero. Right? That wasn't zero. I just have to be careful when I divide by it. But I don't have to worry about those pieces. I can just divide it out. If you don't like that, put it all in there and then divide it out. What happened? What's up? You right? Tell me. What did you do from there to there? From here to here? Uh, no, from here to the here? top. Of, so y double prime equals that line. There? Yep. So all I did was put those together. Oh, okay. Those gotcha. light terms, yeah. Oh, I thought you were like dividing or something. I was like, what the heck is going on? Just rewriting. All right, yeah. gotcha. <laughs> so let's see, 6u double prime uh, plus 4u prime plus uh, 2 thirds u, right? Is that cool, everybody? Let's see, plus u prime. Plus one third u minus u. And then, all right, let me stop. I know you gotta be careful, and if you don't like that, because I made a mistake the other day, we just we caught it. It's easy enough to catch it if you're trying not to write any e's down, and you look back and you have an e written down, well, then erase the damn thing, right? I mean, you're going in knowing they're all gonna cancel. Is everybody actually really cool with what just happened? No. Yeah. Tell me. What? No. All right. I could put an e to the x over 3 next to all of these, right? Because yeah. what did I do? I put y double prime there. But I divided by e to the x over 3 before I put shit in there, because that's what I'm going to do if I put shit in there. I'm going to divide everything by e to the x over 3. 
Why can I do that? Because everybody's got e to the x over 3. And e to the x over 3 can't equal 0. So that's some time. So then everything becomes 1, and then on the other side is 0 still. Yeah, so I can kill these. Because yeah. I'm going to divide by them anyway. Die. You didn't have to do that one, Jeff. Okay. All right. What happens if I use stuff? Does it do what it's supposed to do? Yeah. Two thirds, one third is a whole U minus U. Uh -huh. You are dead. And then I end up with 6U double prime plus 5U prime equals zero. Okay, everybody up. Yep, divide by six, I like it. And again, I have really no qualms about skipping some substitution steps when you don't really need to, but here's what it officially would look like. W prime plus five six W equals zero. Do you guys notice? Well let's see. What do I do from there? Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, this is also <laughs> separable. Separable, yeah. This is just a W. Here. This is uh, this is uh, autonomous, right? And any autonomous one is automatically separable. So it doesn't matter which way you want to do. It. Let's do the E way. Let's do. Uh, what the heck happened? D, X, So what do I get there? Four, six, X. You get E to the? Five, six, X. Five, six, X. What size is this? So then you get real quick. See why this makes sense? If you did this derivative, wouldn't it be w prime uh, times e to the five six x plus five six w e to the five six x, right? Because I know a lot of you guys are so comfortable with st skipping the step, but then you get wrong shit and you have no idea that it's wrong. If you actually multiply everything here by e to the five six x e to the 5, 6, x, you can see the product will happen. You can see it. w prime e to the 5, 6, x plus 5, 6, w e to the 5, 6, x. You can see it. You can verify it. You can take a second and verify it. Or you can, you can just not. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's totally up to you. Equals zero. e to the 5, 6, x times 0. Okay, like so you get w e to the 5, 6, x equals c. c. So you get w equals C E to the All right, negative five six X. I'll just say it. All right? Divide both sides by it. W is U prime. So U prime equals that stuff. So U is gonna be E to the negative five six divided by six. Let's call it C one. C one, E to the negative five six X divided by and negative five six so times six fifths, negative six fifths, which you can just suck into this, plus C2. C2. Okay. And then finally, I'm just gonna get through this. Y equals U E to the X over three. That's where we started at. So Y equals uh, what do you do? I'm gonna suck this in together. Oh, paparazzi. So I get C3 E to the five what is it? Negative five six X plus C2 times e to the x over 3, I get oh, no. c3, negative 5, 6, 2, 6 is negative 1 half, so negative x over 2 plus c2 e to the x over 3. That's the complete answer. What's y2? Here's y1, so here's y2. Oh, shit, there's e. Okay. So why do you put a c3 for? Is it wrong? Because I, I sucked in the negative 6 fifths, which yeah. changes the constant. Yeah. What happened when you? What happened there when you changed from W back to U? Oh, W is U prime. It's how U prime is this, and then I integrated. 
Sorry. Yeah. U prime is this. Uh -huh. So then I integrate it to get U. I integrate this to get U. Yeah. I like it. Now, I, I've basically already done the next section for the most part. There's one case that's a little weird, and there's another case that we've sort of done. We did the primary case, which is related to this. You guys remember? Uh, can you can can? I'm going to leave this here. Any other questions on what happened over there? Yes. Why you change a C to C one? Uh, just to kind of, it's kind of standard to have C1 and C2. You don't have to. You can have C and C1. As long as they're differentiated, you're okay. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm going to take this away. And I'm going to remind you about what we already did with this kind of problem. Like we basically did the first part of section 4.3. What's up? Oh, you getting that part? Okay. Yeah. Which, let's see if you guys remember, we've done a couple of these already. You assume that the answer to this, it, we already know this from before, let's pretend I don't know. Assume the answer to this is of the form what? E to the mx. E to the mx. Why does that make sense? Because E to the mx is the only function who is like terms with its own derivative. I like it. So that means y prime is m e to the mx, which means y double prime is m squared e to the mx. Right? This is beautiful. This is a, this is a valid method. We're gonna, this is the method for section 4.3. So then I end up with, eventually, I just end up with 6m squared, all the e's divide out, plus m minus 1. Do you see the connection there? The order becomes the power, right? Not by magic, not because of the, what I just said actually happens. The order becomes the power. No, because through that... Substitution, that is just what happens. That is a pattern we observe, and then we can use that pattern. You can't make order become power. That sounds like a weird phrase. Imperial school or something. How do you make order become power? How do I factor this? It's got to be 2 and 3, right? Yeah. And then make the middle one 1 the product that has the larger number and it has to be positive. Uh, you guys should have a way to do that. Right? Plus 3m minus 2m is positive m. And the one times negative 1 is negative 1. Right? Come on. So look, I get m equal 1 third, right? Bam! m equals negative 1 half. Bam! That was easier. Second? That was easier. Yes, of course it was easier. So, so this reduction of order method is not something that we really carry through. It is a part of other methods. So there is a case where this, where this what we just did, breaks down. And here it is. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do this case. What case would this break down? Well, where would this break down? What's got to be true about these two functions? They must be... Linearly independent. Must be. So when will this process break down if the m's I get are the same? The same. Shit. So for example, yeah, we did it like this, I think. Uh, let's see, what about just make it simple real quick. So you do this, which probably should be at the point where you don't have to do it, but to be honest, I'm not saying you do this, but later we're going to do something that feels like this, but if you're not careful, you're going to make a very simple, stupid mistake. So if you're not sure, you should always go back to fundamentals, actually do this. But what does this become after that substitution? I'm sorry. I say that plus six. And this, of course, is... Minus four, right? yeah. So you get m equals 4. So I get one solution. But the other solution can't be the same thing. That doesn't make any sense. It's got to be a linearly independent. Right? 
So what method do I have that could save my ass? Oh yeah. I know one solution, I don't know another one. See, this is a perfectly valid place. Now the funny thing is, we use reduction of order once, we go, oh, that's always going to happen, and then we forget about it. And then poor little reduction of order is, again, considered to be, what the shit do we need that? But Because right now we don't know what the hell the second thing is. So uh, let's, let's semi-quickly do reduction of order again. So I would say uh, y equals u e to the 4x. So since since we got two fours, we can't determine. Yeah, because it can't be e to four x and then another e to the four x because those are obviously not linearly independent. Okay. So this is like the first step is to try it this way and then yeah. you get. We're about to use reduction of order. You guys are not going to have to use reduction of order in section four three because once we do it once, we realize the same thing's going to happen every time. Well, we'll try it to anyway. We'll see. Okay. Uh, so here I'm going to do this semi quickly. So. No. See if you see anything freaky, and you're like everything's freaky. Now this will be four u. This will be four u prime plus four u prime, again, right? All right. So you guys see that? Second piece of that. First piece of that. Like terms. Uh, plug this in, and I'll get this. So here's uh, y double prime. Here's negative 8y prime. So here's another way you could do this. I'm going to build each piece. Negative 8y prime would be negative 8u prime uh, minus 32u. Is that, is that cool? That's it. Negative 8y prime. And then it's plus 16y. Plus 16y will be, where'd you go? Here. Plus 16u e to the 4x. And then all my u shit. I don't know if you guys are frantically copying this down here. That's bit, fine. Bit, yeah. All the U stuff goes away. And also, U prime. all the U prime stuff goes away. So then I end up with, I end up with, and of course that's supposed to be zero, so my, my, I don't need this anymore. My equation becomes, where'd it go? Here it is, U double prime E to the 4X equals zero because all the other pieces cancel. So u double prime equals zero. So u prime is C1. So u is C1. C1x plus C2. Every time we do this, this would happen. This, there was nothing special of what, what I, why did I pick this? Because I knew it was going to become m minus 4 squared. Anything I do, the very same thing is going to happen. And if you go through the pattern, if you try another one, you'll see the very same thing happens and happens. So what am I going to actually pick up? Let's see. So if I do y equals u times e to the 4x, one answer is e to the 4x, like we already knew. The other answer is x e to the 4x, always. So to get repeated roots, and if you've already looked ahead to, you know, case two, repeated roots, you just stick in a factor of x on the, the guy that wants to be there twice. You're like, no, you can't be there twice. You could be here, and then x times that could be there. And those are linearly independent. You could do the, <laughs> I'm afraid to admit this. I was about to say, you can do the Wolfenstein. I think I watched that YouTube video. You could do the Ronskin. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Wolfenstein. You can do the Ronskin on this and double check, but these are linearly independent, for sure. Are right, you guys? So if you have repeated roots, that's what you do. If you get m equals seven twice, then one is e to the seven x, the other one's x e to the seven x. It's so beautiful. We wouldn't know that shit without section four two though. So four two is stupid important. Don't ever forget that. I have people that skip that and just teach this shit, and I'm like, oh, what the fuck? Where does the x come from? Excuse me. Uh, okay, the last one is the weirdest one, and this is where I want you guys to do some stuff that you have pushed back into the recesses of your brain. This sounds like it's going to be fun. Let me remind you a few things. This is uh, related to case three. Oh, if you have it. This is not the most obvious answer in the world if you look at case three. Has everybody got one of these? 
four two four three handout. Okay. Time is it, man? I think it's the same thing. Oh, same thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, in the spirit of this, I, let me see if you guys. Let me see if this sounds familiar. Or it looks familiar. Is that a Taylor series of UFS? Yeah, I'm cheating a little bit because it's been a while since I did these. Now what's neat is you'll notice already some similarities here. Yeah. Is it minus? I think it's plus. Yeah. Good old cosine. No, it's minus. You should go with your gut check. Uh, plus. This will be a minus. Blah blah. blah. Okay. So yes, those are Taylor series. Uh, this is not totally out of nowhere because we are going to talk about DEs that have series solutions only. Functions are Taylor series that have a nice way to represent them. Right? Functions that are representable by Taylor series, they are actually functions are just a nice way to represent those Taylor series. There are Taylor series that have no nice way to represent them, like ln of x, e to the x. Mm -hmm. So there are DEs whose answers are only sums of infinite functions, you know, like this. So, yeah, it's neat. Uh, all right. So what I want you to do is, have we got this one? Yeah. Was that from earlier? Uh, look at this. What's? Right. Look at that is based on what I told you. Shouldn't be too hard. No. So you get that multiplied pi by each term. Replace x with? I. I x. I like it. That's the beautiful thing about series is whatever I put here, I just replace it in there because that's a function of x, that's a function of x. So if I change that, I change that. And the only thing you have to be careful about when you're doing this is the powers of I and what happens? Maybe Have you guys ever seen, I think I showed you this real quick, but here's one, here's I, here's negative one, here's negative I. So it goes one to I to negative one to negative I, one to I. When you multiply by negative one, it's a full rotation. When you multiply by uh, square root of negative one, that's a half rotation. That's all it is, it's just rotations. This axis exists. This is the lateral axis to the real x-axis. Oh, shit. Right. If we were to call them lateral numbers instead of imagined numbers, it would have been so much better. Because that's what they really are. They're, la they're to the side of the real axis. And without them, we actually have an incomplete picture. Everything you've ever drawn was incomplete. Every graph you've ever made, incomplete. And, and you think, real quick, the x-axis has a lateral axis. The y-axis has a lateral axis. So if you're talking about three dimensions, the z-axis has a lateral axis, right? That's a lot of dimensions. So I can't blame us for not wanting to draw them. Uh, so what do you guys got? What is this? One plus i Yep. What's i cubed? Yeah. So minus i x cubed over 3 factorial. I guess i to the fourth is? Plus. Yes, yeah, good. Plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial. Now notice. Notice that all your real stuff, all the real stuff, the real part. So the 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial. Uh, plus x to the fourth over four factorial. What is that? Cosine. Cosine. And the imaginary part, or the lateral part, but oh well, let me say imaginary anyway. Sort of. It's i times Sorry. x minus x cubed over three factorial. The x to the fifth would have been plus, right? 
x to the fifth over five, and of course that is i times sine. sine. So e to the i x equals cosine x plus i sine x. So for example, all right, let me stop there for a second. You guys have to have seen this before. Yeah. Email your old teacher, whoever taught you 280, and say, what the hell's wrong with you? Why didn't you show me this kick-ass cool stuff so my mind wasn't blown later? This, uh, real quick, what is e to the i pi? Cosine pi plus i sine pi is one. Mm. Zero. Negative, one. Negative one. So e to the i pi plus one is zero. That's Euler's identity. Got a freaking shirt that says that shit on that. <laughs> Math people get all excited about that, yeah. Oh. What's up? How'd the i sign go away? It didn't. What do you mean? What's what's sine of pi? Yeah, how'd you guys learn sine and cosine? You know sine likes y? So any angle, if you're at any angle that has no x in it, then sine's gonna be maximum. If you have any angle that has no y in it, y in it, sine's gonna hate it. Right? Sokotoa is shit. <laughs> yeah. It, it makes for nice jokes about going to Camp Sokotoa. I don't blame you for that. That's kind of funny. But it's bullshit. If you just stuck to cosine likes x, sine likes y, everything after that is so much easier. Everything. In physics, cosine is sort of a percentage of the thing that lies in the x direction. It's a really cool, it's not really a true percentage, but it's a great way to think about it. Sine is a percentage that lies in the y direction. It's, it's kick ass. Um, anyway, everybody cool? You guys see how that leads to this? Yeah. And then, so if I rotate through an, uh, an angle of pi, I end up at negative one. That's what that's saying. Mm -hmm. which, may, which is exactly, if I rotate through an angle of pi, where do I end up? Negative one. That's all that's saying, but then that this is so cool because it's got one, two, three, four, five fundamental numbers all in one equation related. That's why we kind of, you know, oh, that's why you get all you know, crazy about it. Okay, that's why we make shirts about it. So the only reason I do this is uh, in case you've never seen it, which I think is a crime. <laughs> uh, and I don't know if you guys feel the same way, but I mean, I'm hoping to God some of you guys are like, oh, shit. Uh, and also because it, it makes case three make sense. Uh, case three is when I get, uh, has everybody got what they want from this? More than you want? Is that still going? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's a trooper. Oh, yeah, it's going to stop here soon. Uh, so watch, real quick. The last case is when I get imaginary M's. So the simplest way to make that happen would be something like, As well as the associated thing after I do my, my substitution. And I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to show something, remind you about something interesting. Uh, what do I get when I do that substitution? I get m squared plus 25 equals 0. How do you factor that? m plus 5, m plus 5. No. Plus 5 by m minus 5 by. You can't use real numbers and factor that shit. The only way that two real numbers can add, multiply, can, can cancel, is if they're opposite signs, and then they have to multiply being negative. Complex numbers, though, they're fine with it. Okay, maybe. Uh, you guys must have seen this shit before, right? Yeah. Please, okay. Yeah. So what do I get? I get e to the, what's my two values of n then? 5i and negative 5i. So I get e to the 5i x. It's like 6. I love that. e to the 5 i x and I get e to the negative 5 i x which is very unsatisfactory so through using what we just proved and I'm not going to do these steps that's why I focus on that if I use what we just proved we end up with the form that's on case 3 you know case 3 is a little bit more disgusting of an example but So we got, we got something nice. We got m equal to 5i, m equal to negative 5i. So look at case 3. What's alpha for me? Zero. Zero. So that means that e to the alpha x is e to the 0 is 1. 
And, and look back, what, what function is related to its own second derivative? Not just the e, but also, what else? What function becomes like terms of the second derivative? Sine and cosine. There's so many freaking cosine. Right? That's why it makes sense that I can relate this through this to sine and cosine. From the beginning, we knew that the answer should be sine and cosine. We did stuff like this on like the first or second day. Just to kind of show how this stuff relates. Okay, maybe. Maybe. Okay. So let's see, alpha is zero, beta is five. So what would this look like in the form in case three then? So it'd be e to the zero, which is one. C one cosine five x plus C two sine five x. I love it. So if there was a 36 here, this would have just been cosine six x, sine six x. That's beautiful in itself. Because you take two derivatives and out pops 6, 6, 36. And in this case, it'd be 5, 5, 25. It'd be negative. It would cancel this shit. It'd be zero. Holy shit. Okay. I like that sound. So we showed that on the test. Is that acceptable? Yeah, we can, we can. This together with this leads to this directly. You just have to memorize the form of case three. Yeah. Yes. So alpha, if we had a value for it, would it be plus? That, so no, no, no. If, if alpha, if this would have been like 1 plus 5i, 1 minus